Hello viewers and welcome back to The Model Guy. In this episode, we will be covering Airfix's Mark 19 Photo Reconnaissance Spitfire in 148 scale. This kit was released in 2015 and was one of the first aircraft that Airfix decided to retool and try to compete with Tamiya and Edward and those other companies. Now, this aircraft was a big improvement for them, like the detail in the cockpit's a lot better. However, being air fix, there's still some fit issues and for some reason the panel lines are really deep and seem to be a little out of scale. But I decided to pick up the Edward de interior detail kit for this aircraft just to try to improve it a little bit and also try some new scratch building techniques I've been wanting to attempt in a video. This Spitfire I built at the same time that I was building the Mustang in my last video. It was part of a D-Day group build and I decided to do the Mark 19 because it entered service in May of 1944, just in time for Operation Overlord. The Mark 19 was the last photo reconnaissance version of the Spitfire, and it was the pinnacle of Spitfire development based on the development and finally mating the Griffin engine with the Spitfire airframe. The Griffin had been in development since 1941, however, problems along the production line caused it to be delayed, and only around 220 Spitfires were built in Mark 19 with the Griffin engine. With the improved power of the Griffin engine, there was a drawback as pilots who transitioned from a Merlin-powered Spitfire were coming from an aircraft where the propeller spun in the opposite direction. So on takeoff, pilots could be surprised when they suddenly found the aircraft torquing and trying to ground loop in the opposite direction than it normally would, and there were some training accidents. Photo reconnaissance pilots had many more challenges than their fighter pilot brethren, and the first of those being that their aircraft were completely unarmed. They had no means of defending themselves except for their speed. Another thing is they traveled alone a lot of the time and often they were flying over targets that had just been bombed and you can imagine that German fighters would still be up in the area trying to find stragglers. One thing that the photo reconnaissance aircraft did have going for them is they'd often fly at very high altitudes like 42,000 feet and that was one of the reasons that their aircraft were painted completely blue, is they didn't have to worry about aircraft being above them and looking down. They would only be from below in the side. So the blue gave them a little bit of an advantage of helping them blend in with their surrounded environment. Having said that, though, you'll notice that a lot of photo reconnaissance aircraft still had their invasion stripes painted on long after D-Day when other aircraft had dropped them. One of the reasons to explain this is that the photo reconnaissance aircraft were starting to operate at lower altitudes because of the tactical nature of their mission at this point. They were trying to get, stay ahead of the Army and get up-to-date photos to get them back in time, and they didn't have time to repaint the aircraft between operations. So they just stayed blue, and they kept the invasion stripes on just to reduce friendly fire accidents because there's so many more aircraft operating over Europe at this point that they would suddenly drop on a lone fighter painted in a color they're not used to, and that would look like an easy target to a lot of pilots. The paint job I'm doing on this aircraft matches an RAF squadron in January of 1945 that still had the invasion stripes on the fuselage of the aircraft. The Mark 19 PR version of the Spitfire's last flight was in 1963 when it was providing dissimilar combat training for English electric lightnings just in case those pilots had to fight Indonesian P-51s in a conflict. However, it never happened, but it provided valuable training to the pilots. The Spitfire ended its career as one of the few RAF aircraft that were in service before and after World War II. By the time development of the Spitfire ended, it had three and a half times the range of the initial Mark I Spitfire, and it was almost 100 miles an hour faster. At this point in the video, you'll see that I'm cutting out part of the Edward instructions and folding it up, and this is to try and recreate a flight map that would have been used by Spitfire pilots or any pilot from World War II. Although it seemed like a good idea where I tuck it in place here in the chart holder, unfortunately when you close up the fuselage and put the canopy on, it's not very visible, so I'll have to come up with a different idea for this next time. One thing I find with Airfix's kits is their plastic seems to be a little bit thicker than it needs to be, especially where it attaches on the sprues, and it also has this soft and grainy texture to it where if you don't fill it with a really good primer like Mr. Surfacer or Styrene's, you have to sand it a little bit just to get rid of that grain, and it kind of takes the fun out of the build. As the cockpit closes up here, one thing I wanted to try on this kit was a bit more scratch building. It's something I'm still trying out and I'm still new to, but I decided to do a couple little things to improve the quality of this kit, like opening up this access panel at the rear of the aircraft and building in some internal framework and some control wires just to make it a little bit more interesting. So what I've done is I've taken a piece of tape, 
trace the panel onto it and then put that on top of a piece of uh, styrene board and cut it out and sand at the edges. And it was still a little bit too thick to match the other doors, so I actually sanded it down as it laid flat just to reduce that thickness. Initially, I tried to cut this shape out with my wife's Cricut machine. However, the styrene was too thick. I ordered some 0 0.005 millimeter styrene afterwards that was clear and retried the Cricut machine and it actually cut it out pretty well. I just had to change the settings on the machine itself. So that's something I learned moving forward. Another thing I wanted to do was open up the inspection holes on the wings. So I used a just a small drill bit to punch my pilot hole, drilled it out with a larger drill bit, and then just used the Dremel to finally widen that hole with a file until it was at the exact width I wanted it. You can see in this shot as well how thick those tabs are holding the wing in place. I don't know if the sprue has to be that thick to secure it. I just find it just makes for a little bit more cleaning on the airfix side of things. Now, one other thing I learned as well when I was filing this hole out is that I should have, before I even drilled the hole, thinned the wing with a file. So I learned that, and that was another point I pretty much wanted to remember going forward for the next time I attempt this, just to give it a more realistic scale. Because as you can see here on the first hole, that wing just looks a little bit thicker than it should. But this is all about learning and moving forward. So if you're not trying new things when you're doing models, are you really going to get any better is the way I look at it. So once once I've drilled the hole on the wing, I just glue some styrene to the back, drill another hole, ream that out until it looks like a proper inspection hole. So it was a little bit of work, but once you put some the tiny bolt holes around that, it actually turned out pretty decent, I think. But like I said, it was a trial and error thing. It was something new, and I learned enough traveling moving forward that I should be able to improve on that for the next model. While we're looking at wings, the Spitfire Mark 19 was one of the first aircraft to use what's known today as a wet wing. And a wet wing is an aerospace engineering technique where the aircraft's wing is sealed so you can actually fill it with fuel. This saved a little bit of weight as well in the aircraft because instead of having a heavier rubber slash plastic metal fuel tank inside the wing, a section of the wing itself became a fuel tank. Here I'm just using super glue and lead wire just to add a little bit more detail to the rear of the aircraft. So again, that panel I'm working on now is not part of the kit that was opened up. So this soldering wire is going to give the illusion of control wires and structure of the rear of the aircraft. To balance out the weight of the new Griffin engine, the radio compartment of the Spitfire Mark 19 was actually moved a little more towards the rear of the aircraft. This is the final coat of Mr. Color Silver Paint for the inside of the fuselage before you close it up. And once it's painted, I'll just add some Tamiya panel liner just to give it a little bit of depth and make it look a little untidy. With this being a photo reconnaissance version of the Spitfire, Airfix has given you three cameras to put inside the aircraft. However, the detail on the cameras isn't great at all, and it's just one piece of plastic. There's no lens or anything. So what I've done is with my Dremel, again, is just drilled out where the lens should be and make a sort of upside down cake inside of two layers. That way, once it's painted, by filling it with a micro crystal clear, it gives it the illusion of a lens. And I'm also drilling some holes to add some soldering wire just to make it look like it's plumbed in and it's part of the aircraft and not just a piece of plastic sitting there. I initially bought this lead wire kit off of Cabela's online for $25. It includes six different gauges of wire and I've used it to simulate everything from instrument panel wiring to coolant lines on engines. So it was a good investment. And another thing you can do is if you don't want to spend money like that online but still want wiring, find old plugs and everything and strip the wiring inside. A copper wire is usually made up of several fine wires depending on the gauge you find and you can use those as well. Photo reconnaissance aircraft, including the Spitfire Mosquito and US aircraft, played an important role during the build up to D Day as they had 1,700 members of the photo reconnaissance unit viewing almost 85,000 images daily to come up with a comprehensive picture of German forces in Normandy prior to the invasion. Because of the pounding the German Air Force had taken by late 1944, they started to counter the Allied reconnaissance aircraft by only moving their units at night. And whereas the D-Day buildup was a major success in photo reconnaissance, the Battle of the Bulge was a major failure as the Germans had managed to counter it so efficiently that they were able to move an entire army to oppose the Allies in December of 1944. 
One interesting fact is German reconnaissance units in the air were having trouble penetrating the air defenses over England during the build-up to D-Day, and it was only a few aircraft that the U.S. and British decided to let through the defenses to find the fake camps to try to throw off German intelligence. Now that I've painted the cameras on the model, you can see me adding the micro crystal clear to add the lens inside the camera. And now that everything's starting to dry, I'm painting my soldering wires with Citadel paints just to add a little bit of contrast in the base. I've taken some artistic liberty here, and it's this is not 100% accurate at all. The cameras in World War II in the Royal Air Force were actually painted blue, but because they're inside of a blue aircraft, I just decided to make them black just to have a little more contrast and then make it interesting. With all the sub-assemblies in place, it's now time to close up the fuselage, and I actually had very little issue here, just squeezing the fuselage together and adding a little bit of Tamiya extra thin and then moving on and allowing it to dry gave me pretty much a very minimal seam to be cleaned up. The worst part of the seam was right here behind the cockpit and it actually required a little bit of filler and some more sanding to clean up. Here I'm adding just a little bit of Tamiya smoke to the lens just to give it a little bit more depth. And with the cameras complete, it's now time to clean up the seam between the fuselage halves. One small issue I did have with this kit when joining the wings was that there was quite a bit of a gap between the wing and the wing root. And it seems that this is the same wing that Airfix has in their new release of the Mark 24 Spitfire, I believe. So what I've had to do here is after gluing the wing halves together is actually squeeze the fuselage with my thumb a little bit just to get it to spread out to close that gap. Not ideal, but by squeezing it and just adding a little bit of filler, I was able to get rid of that seam at the wing root. It was just a little bit of work and typical of some of the Airfix kits I've done so far. Photo reconnaissance in aircraft is used for several reasons. Some of them are to select bombing targets, determine bombing accuracy, assess bombing damage, determine enemy orders of battle, analyze equipment capability, pinpoint defense positions, serve as a basis for maps, and to try to search for indications of enemy initiatives or intentions. This was the same role that aircraft first had when used in warfare in World War I when they were used to spot for artillery as well. Another successful aircraft that the RAF used for reconnaissance was the de Havilland Mosquito. And it was the de Havilland Mosquito that noticed the V-2 missile sites being built in 1943 that sent an alarm up the Allied chain as they realized that German rocket development was a lot further along than they anticipated. Your aircraft can take the best pictures in the world, but unfortunately you still have people interpreting those photos. And one of the big drawbacks of that is that people can make mistakes. And a big example of that is just before Operation Market Garden in September of 1944, the RAF had confirmed pictures of German tanks in and around Arnhem, but they decided to push forward with the attack anyways and just disregarded these tanks as a few out-of-service vehicles, which proved a costly mistake. One of the biggest challenges of this build was trying to make the blue color interesting. Because it's a photo reconnaissance Spitfire, it's a single color. There's nothing else to change up the monotony of that or break it up. So I wanted to make the aircraft look heavily weathered and to make it a little more interesting than just a solid blue. And the way I've done that is start with my usual black basing. However, I left a black undercoat pretty visible and then started shading in some lighter grays and darker grays just to add some variation in the paint color. So you can see here, it's almost as if I've pre-shaded the panel lines, but that's just from black basing and trying to emphasize them just a little bit more. So here I am bringing in the light gray. And when I finished all this, you can notice there's a huge patchwork difference in the paint. And although this, this looks stark right now, what will happen is as I come in with the main color, the PRU blue, I've thinned this down completely to almost like 5% paint to 95% thinner. And the idea behind that is I'm going to be putting very thin, fine coats on top of the paint on this pre-shading. So as I slowly build this up, it'll start to change to the PRU blue, but you'll still see those variations in the paints underneath. You can really tell how thin the main color paint is over the next few minutes of video here because it's taking a little bit of time to build up and start to blend in that uh, black basing effect. This is actually the third Airfix Spitfire that I've built in 148 scale, the first two being the Mark I and the Mark V Spitfire. Now, on the Mark I and the Mark V, 
for some weird reason because the kit's been set up on the tooling there's a modular kit to swap out parts to make different marks there's issues with fit like the biggest example if you've built these is the cowling in front of the windscreen for some reason it doesn't want to seat properly on the mark 5 and i actually had to do quite a bit of sanding and cut almost a full millimeter off the cowling at the bottom just to get it to sit flush and even then it was a lot of sanding and filling afterwards and rescribing to have that nice clean spitfire look this kit here the mark 19 was the first time that i built one of airfix's kits of the spitfire and didn't have that issue at all and probably the reason for that is being a griffin spitfire there's only one or two variants you would use it for that fuselage so they didn't have to worry about swapping in different wing armaments or no sections for a different mark it was just a matter of cutting down the back of the fuselage which would be an entirely new tooling anyways now in the hurricane and my Thunderbolt videos, I promise you that I'd be doing some more work with the Cricut machine, and here it is. Because this kit comes with the post-war markings, or the Swedish markings, I had to make my own roundels for the aircraft. And I did that by simply opening up the Cricut software, finding that roundel, and cutting it into a two-color image. And then I laid down to me as new dark red, which was a perfect match, in my opinion, to that roundel red and then covered up with Vallejo's signal blue. This saved me from trying to mix paints and get that right shade every time. I won't lie, sometimes I can be lazy, and if I can fire it right from a bottle, I'm gonna take that option every time. Now that the masks are pulled up and you can see the results, I'll let you know that uh, when I did the roundels on the fuselage, I decided to try it another way, and I painted the roundel first, and then painted the invasion stripes over top of it, just to see if I could get away from that bleed effect on the outside of the roundel that was there. You can't see it because I fired the blue on top of the red, but if you use white, that's one of the worst colors from my research for bleeding out under the tape. So with the fuselage, with the stripes over top of the roundel, it was an even cleaner look and probably a route I'll go in the future from now on. In hindsight, painting on the markings was a huge advantage over using decals because one, I saved money because I didn't have to order an aftermarket decals to build the livery I wanted to. Two, I didn't have to worry about trying to sand down decal carrier film to match clear coat after two or three more layers of clear. And lastly, it just sinks nicely into the panel lines and divots. And it's the same way they would paint an aircraft. They didn't use vinyl and they didn't use decals on aircraft in World War II. They just painted them straight on. So you're replicating that. And at the end of the day, it might be a little bit more work, but it balances out compared to the sanding and clear coats you have to do with decals. The biggest downfall I can say right now though is my wife's Cricut machine doesn't seem to be capable of recreating small font for registration numbers. So uh, I see the guys using silhouettes seem to have a lot better luck with that. So that might be the route you want to try out. But if you're using a Cricut, uh, you may find yourself limited from doing that. What seems to happen with the Cricut is when you're trying to get those tight parallel lines, it starts to curve. If you're wondering what this extra coat of just MLT is for, it's just to smooth out the gloss coat and give you a very clean finish, and it's easier to lay down your wash on. Now here you can see I'm using a stencil from RB Productions, and what it's doing is giving me a very random spatter pattern on the wing. And at first when I did this with the Tamiya buff, it was a very stark contrast, and I kind of panicked that I may have mixed that up and gone too far with the weathering and it didn't look right. But once I hammered on this wash, let it dry and wiped it off. It did an awesome job of blending in that buff spatter and it gave the paint an even more battered look that I really enjoyed. One piece of advice I can give people that are doing models is don't be afraid to experiment and try new things. Don't fall into the whole rut of, well, if everybody's doing this, it must be the right thing to do. Don't be afraid to try something new. Putting that spatter on as a post effect it was kind of along the same idea of a salt washer using that as a filter, but without having to worry about the cleanup. So it was something I tried and it worked. So don't be afraid to tr try new things because even if I had screwed that up, the gloss coat would have allowed me to come back in with just some water and wipe away that buff. Now, even though the aircraft's looking weathered, I wanted to put in a little bit of light blue oil paint and brush that in just to still give that paint a little bit more depth. And at this point, I felt it was really starting to come together and I didn't want to push it too much further. 
because I didn't want to overdo the effect. And the nice thing with oil paints on top of a gloss coat, again, is you can go back in and touch things up or wipe it off and start again if you don't like the effect. It's a great way to experiment with your weathering and see what really works for you. On the bottom of the aircraft here, you can see I'm doing the oil spills. And this is built up over three layers, like just streak it out, let it dry, put a little bit more on, streak that out and let it dry. And at the end of the day, you can go from having a Spitfire that's probably halfway to its next service or one that looks like it should be seizing up on the flight line. My favorite part of doing a build of any model is when you're in those final stages and you get to see how it's coming together, especially when you add the flat coat and that starts blending everything together. You're almost seeing what the final product is going to look like. Now, one of the things I tried on this aircraft at the start of the video and you see me doing was building those inspection port covers. What I've done here is use a Cricut machine to cut small circles that are about three millimeters wide and then cut a slightly smaller radius circle to glue to it to make an inspection panel cover. With scratch building, this probably takes me one step closer to actually losing my mind or going deeper down the rabbit hole, but it's been a fun experiment and definitely something I enjoy the final look of. So I'll have to try it out on another build down the road. That ends this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did like the video, click subscribe and hit the like button. If not, leave a comment and let me know why. And just to summarize this build, I was pretty excited to have it done in time for the Nanton model show this year because it was the first time I entered the show and I actually took bronze in the scratch building category with this aircraft. So that was a huge boost and definitely made me want to do it again. So don't be afraid to try new things. This is the model guy and I'll see you next time.